Welcome to Classroom Demos in Plasma Physics with the Plasma Demo Kit. I'm Andrew Salzman with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Plasma Science and Fusion Center. A plasma is a state of matter common in nature which is made up of ionized atoms. Some examples of plasmas in nature are the sun, lightning, and the aurora borealis or northern lights. A plasma is a state of matter much like a solid, liquid, or gas. However, a plasma has a distinct difference from the other three states of matter in that it is ionized. In other words, the electrons and ions can move freely from one another. In the more common states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, the configuration of the matter is due to the interaction between the electrons. At very low temperatures or energies, the electrons between atoms are, bond are bonded close enough together so that the material is a solid. It has a both definitive volume and shape. As we add energy to matter, the solid melts into a liquid. Now it is a defined volume, but not a, des a defined shape. As we continue to add heat or energy, the liquid boils into a gas. Now the individual atoms or molecules are not bound to one another. They have neither a defined shape nor a defined volume. The atoms are free to move independently. However, these atoms are still neutral. In other words, the electrons in the atoms are still bound to the nucleus. However, if we put in sufficient, a sufficient amount of energy, the electrons will have so much energy they are able to escape the electrostatic interaction between the electrons and the nuclei and move freely. At this point, we consider the gas to be ionized, and we define it as a plasma. To expand on this concept, when given enough energy, a gas becomes ionized, causing the electrons and ions to move freely and independently of one another. At this point, we say the gas becomes a plasma. Prior to ionization, the electrons, which are negatively charged, are trapped around the nucleus of the atoms, which are positively charged by the electrostatic interaction between the two. This is like having the electrons trapped in a potential well. However, when this gas is given enough energy by means of adding heat, eventually the electrons have sufficient energy to escape this potential well and move freely from the nucleus. At this point, we say that the nuclei becomes ionized and the gas turns into a plasma. This is several important differences in characteristics between a gas and a plasma. For instance, while a gas is typically electrically insulating and only exchanges energy between atoms by direct collisions, whereas in a plasma, the electrons and ions move independently. In this manner, the electrons and ions can all interchange force between one another through electrostatic fields. This gives the plasma a collective behavior, allowing it to flow and interact with electric currents and magnetic fields in ways that the gas will not. The plasma is electrically conductive and can carry currents. And by means of this, a magnetic field can apply force onto a plasma that is carrying current. We will begin by exploring plasmas in your classroom with a plasma ball. In a plasma ball, you have a high-frequency, high-voltage source at the center. This is surrounded by a glass envelope containing a low-pressure gas. Due to the high frequency of the high-voltage source, this can cause capacitive coupling of current through an insulator such as the glass envelope. In other words, when the high-voltage electrode in the center goes to one polarity, it can attract charge of the other polarity which accumulates on the surface of the interior glass insulator. This can draw a current which adds energy to the internal gas and turns it into a plasma. This, this plasma, by means of being electrically conductive, couples that charge to the inner surface of the outer sphere. By placing your hand on the plasma globe, your body acts as a source or sink of charge causing charge to float in and out of your body. This causes the plasma filament to be attracted to your hand 
as the electrical current will follow the path of least resistance. When a hand is placed on the plasma globe, your hand acts as a plate of a capacitor. Current follows the path of least resistance, go from the center of the electrode directly to your hand. Now let's exploit this effect of capacitance by modifying our plasma globe to concentrate the current and use it to excite a known gas into a plasma. We will do this by taking our plasma globe and adding an aluminum foil hat over the outer sphere. This collects the current and acts as a plate of a capacitor. As it's a good conductor, we can clip an alligator lead onto the aluminum foil hat and transfer the current into our vacuum chamber. Be careful when placing the aluminum foil on top of the plasma globe, as the foil may shock you slightly if you touch it. This is safe, but may be a little uncomfortable. We will now use this collected current to excite the neon gas in a neon bulb into a plasma. To do this, firmly grip one lead of a neon bulb and touch the aluminum foil hat on the plasma globe with the other lead. This should not shock you as long as you are holding the lead of the neon bulb firmly. We may also explore the effects of electromagnetic radiation on exciting a gas into a plasma. We can observe that even if the neon light bulb is not touching the aluminum hat, the bulb is still lit by the electromagnetic wave generated by the plasma globe. As we bring the neon light further and further from the globe, we observe the neon light gets dimmer and dimmer. This is an effect of the electromagnetic wave falling off as the inverse square of distance. We will now demonstrate that we are ionizing the atoms in a plasma by use of spectroscopy. We can think of an atom as a positively charged nuclei surrounded by different shells of electrons. We will consider that each of these shells has a different energy level as is a different distance from the nuclei. Occasionally, the electrons in a plasma fall back into being bound to the atomic nuclei. As energy is conserved, this energy must now be released, and it is released as a photon, or as light. This is why a plasma glows. However, if we consider an object that is merely very hot to the point of glowing, we will notice that it emits a continuous spectrum of wavelengths. Since the electrons are falling back into energy levels of known energy, this releases a discrete amount of wavelength or a different color of light, as the energy of a photon is related to its wavelength. Therefore, the spectral lines that we observe from a plasma are dependent on the element which is being ionized. We will now observe this for nitrogen as well as neon. We will begin by examining the spectral lines from a neon bulb. As the neon bulb is held up to the aluminum foil hat on the plasma globe, Observe the color of the light through your spectroscope. Each kit contains a spectroscope which looks like a black plastic box. On one end it has an eyepiece, and on the other end it has a slit. Look through the eyepiece and through the slit at the neon bulb. You will notice that your spectroscope also has a numbered scale. This scale is labeled in hundreds of nanometers of wavelength of light. As you look at the light from the neon bulb through the eyepiece and the, and the slit, the separated spectral lines will appear above the scale. Note the differences between the spectral lines of nitrogen and neon. You should be able to observe that the neon bulb is generating the spectral lines characteristic of neon. The astute observer will notice that although the plasma globe can break down the gas within the globe into a plasma, as well as the gas within the neon light into a plasma, it is not breaking down the atmospheric pressure air surrounding it into a plasma. Why might this be occurring? You would notice, however, that with sufficient voltage it is possible to break down atmospheric pressure gas into a plasma, such as in a lightning strike. This phenomenon of ionizing a gas is known as a Townsend breakdown or how much voltage we need to generate a plasma of a gas depends on the gas pressure. 
we will observe the figure at the top right. Imagine, if you will, two plates connected to a voltage difference. An original random ionization event can generate a free electron or ion. This electron will accelerate within the electric field and will eventually collide with a neutral gas atom. You will remember that if you put sufficient energy into an atom, it can free the electrons and turn that into an ion. Whether this occurs depends on how much energy an electron has when it collides with a neutral atom. Therefore, the distance the electron travels within the electro electric field determines how much energy it has, as well as the strength of the electric field. With sufficient en energy, the electrons colliding with the gas molecule will reduce, release additional electrons and ionize the gas. This process will continue until the entire gas within the volume is broken down into a plasma. The trend on this to observe is that lower pressure is more, has more distance between collisions between electrons and gas molecules. This therefore generates higher energy collisions and the ability to form a plasma at, with a lower electric field. Students will explore this effect by building a vacuum chamber. We will build a simple vacuum chamber for your plasma's experiments in your classroom out of a 50 or 60 milliliter syringe body. A rubber stopper allows the sample to be inserted into the chamber. Two screws in the rubber stopper act as electrodes to transfer high voltage from the atmospheric pressure gas on the outside of the vacuum chamber to the reduced pressure gas on the inside. A hose connects your vacuum chamber to your vacuum pump, allowing the evacuation of gas from your chamber. After connecting your vacuum chamber to your vacuum pump by means of the vacuum hose, the vacuum pump will evacuate gas from the inside of your chamber. This reduces the gas density. Therefore, electrons will travel further before colliding with a neutral gas atom. This makes the lower pressure gas easier and easier to ionize as the pressure decreases. Connect your vacuum chamber to the pump and finger tighten the nut onto the pump connector. Open your vacuum valve. Note that the valve is open when the handle is parallel to the vacuum hose and closed when the handle is perpendicular to the vacuum hose. Ensure your stopper is inserted securely into the end of your syringe and that the lure lock connector at the tip is tightened finger tight. We will be using the collected current on the aluminum foil hat of the plasma globe to power the plasma inside the vacuum chamber. We will do this by connecting one jumper lead to the foil over the plasma globe and connecting that jumper lead to one of the two screws. We will connect the second screw to one end of the second jumper lead and connect that jumper lead to the grounded fin on the vacuum pump motor heatsink. This will complete a circuit. When the plasma globe is turned on, current will flow from the collected in the aluminum foil hat through the jumper lead into the vacuum chamber across the plasma discharge and back into the ground circuit. First, turn on your plasma globe. Then, after ensuring that your vacuum line valve is open, turn on your vacuum pump and observe what occurs within the plasma chamber. After a short amount of time, a concentrated plasma will form. This plasma will then become more and more diffuse. This experiment may be repeated by venting the vacuum chamber to atmosphere by turning off your vacuum pump and opening the plastic vent cap on the vacuum pump side of the connector. This time, when pumping down a second time, close the vacuum valve on your vacuum line just after concentrated plasma forms. Students may then observe the spectral lines of this plasma with your spectroscope. The gas within the plasma chamber is mainly nitrogen from the atmosphere. Compare the spectral lines you observe when looking at this plasma discharge in the vacuum chamber with the spectral lines you observe when observing the neon light. The principal gas in the vacuum chamber is residual nitrogen from the atmosphere. The spectral lines of nitrogen may be observed by the students using the spectroscope. 
we will now pump the vacuum chamber down from atmospheric pressure in increments. We will pump the vacuum chamber down until the first plasma ignites and then close the vacuum valve. We will now open the vacuum valve in increments very briefly. In each step, we will see that the plasma within the chamber becomes more and more diffuse. This occurs because as the gas pressure becomes lower and lower, it becomes easier and easier to excite a greater volume of the plasma with the limited power source of the plasma globe. This is due to Passion's Law. Passion's Law states that up to a very low pressure, it gets easier to start an electrical discharge as pressure decreases. See if you can estimate the pressure within the vacuum chamber for a given voltage. We will now add a new element to the plasma by placing a drop of wet sodium hydroxide on the nut. We will do this by using a wood-handled cotton swab to transfer a small amount of this wet sodium hydroxide to the, one, to the higher nut on the tip. Be careful as this is corrosive. Don't get it on your skin and don't get it into the vacuum pump. Before doing the next demo, you should observe the droplet adhering to the vacuum chamber nut as in this picture. Using the wood handled Q-tip, transfer a small amount of sodium hydroxide to the upper nut of the vacuum chamber electrodes. You should observe a change in the color of your plasma. Consider asking this question to your students. Is the sodium hydroxide getting very hot, or are the sodium atoms becoming ionized in the plasma? How would you tell? We can show that the sodium atoms are being ionized in the plasma by atomic emission spectroscopy. By looking at the orange glow through the spectroscope, we will observe the 568 nanometer and 589 nanometer spectral emission lines of sodium. Due to the finite resolution of these handheld spectroscopes, we will not see two distinct lines, but rather a singular band slightly less than the 600 nanometer mark on the scale, as observed here. This effect is similar to the flame test, where the spectral lines of each individual element excited by a flame are visible. However, just like in a flame test, the colored glow is not because the element is getting hot, but rather because the element is becoming ionized, and electrons are eventually falling back into the vacated electron shells. Plasma bombardment of the sodium within the vacuum chamber accomplishes the same effect. Recall that a plasma is made of interacting charged particles, the positively charged ions and the negatively charged electrons, that now move independently from the ions due to sufficient temperature to escape the potential well. Recall also that moving charge is an electric current, and that a magnetic field exerts a force on a current. Therefore, a magnetic field can be used to guide or confine a plasma. Recall that this is analogous to force on a current carrying wire within a magnetic field. This force may be calculated as the product of current times wire length crossed into the magnetic field vector. We will now demonstrate this effect by establishing a current flow within a wire by means of a battery and exposing this wire to a magnetic field generated by a rare earth magnet. First, we will take the wire and place it within the battery holder when no battery is present. We will observe that the magnet has no effect on the wire, therefore demonstrating that the wire is not magnetic. After placing the battery within the battery holder, a current now flows to the wire. We now observe that the magnetic field from the magnet establishes a force on the moving current within the wire. 
The effects of a magnetic field acting on a beam of moving charged particles may be illustrated with a device called a Crookes tube. Between the years of 1869 and 1875, English physicist William Crookes developed a low-pressure electrical discharge tube and discovered that something moving between the negative and positive end of the tube could be deflected by a magnet. This discovery later led the physicist J.J. Thompson to discover the electron in 1897. A Crookes tube is a low-pressure plasma discharge tube with a phosphor screen to allow the student to visualize the electron beam path. A phosphor is a material that emits light when struck with an electron beam. Students will now assemble a Crookes tube in order to explore this effect on their own. If you receive an assembled plasma demo kit, you will assemble the Crookes tube out of a pre-assembled needle assembly, phosphor screen, syringe body, and stopper assembly. If you receive individual parts, you'll have to assemble these components as described in the assembly video. The rubber stopper assembly may be dismantled to give students an extra assembly task. During the assembly, the needle assembly is screwed into the lure lock fi fitting finger tight. The phosphor screen is placed within the syringe body, and the stopper assembly is pushed into the open end. The nut on the inside of the stopper assembly should be aligned with the slit in the phosphor screen, and located approximately 3 eighths of an inch apart. The vacuum hose from your vacuum chamber experiment may now also be screwed finger tight into the lure lock fitting in the rubber stopper. When the Crookes tube is connected to the vacuum pump, the gas within the Crookes tube will be evacuated through the vacuum hose. An electric field will then be established between the needle and the nut. We will establish this high voltage electric field by means of a high voltage pulse generator included in your kit. This pulse generator is powered by a 12 volt power adapter. The pulse generator will start to operate as soon as it is plugged in. These pulses are generated automatically. When the pulse generator is turned on, do not touch the lead tips or the alligator clips it is connected to. Do not turn on the pulse generator unless it is connected to the Crookes tube under vacuum, as firing the pulse generator without a load may damage the unit. Do not let this unit run for more than one minute at a time or it may overheat. Be careful with this pulse generator, as contact with the high voltage pulse generator leads will hurt. Don't touch the output leads when it is on. The teacher should perform this demo for the middle school classes and supervise high school students. Using the alligator clips, connect the nut to one lead of the high voltage pulse generator and the needle to the other lead of the high voltage pulse generator. Connect the Crookes tube chamber to the vacuum pump through the vacuum line. Ensure that your vacuum valve is open by placing the handle parallel to the vacuum line. The connection polarity of the high voltage pulse generator is not important because this pulse generator has a bipolar output. In other words, it has both a positive and negative voltage swing on either lead. The voltage will first swing one way, biasing the needle positive and the nut negative. In this case, electrons will be emitted from the nut and fall onto the surface of the phosphor screen. The generator will then swing to, to a negative polarity on the needle and a positive polarity on the nut. In this case, electrons will be emitted from the needle, however, they will be hitting the bottom side of the phosphor screen and will not be visible to the user. When a high voltage pulse is applied to the Crookes tube, electrons experience a force, F equals QE, within the electric field between the nut and the needle. This electric field pulls electrons off the nut and accelerates it towards the needle. This distribution of traveling electrons is collimated into a thin beam by the slit within the Crookes tube screen disc. This slit blocks all but a narrow portion of the electron beam. This fine electron beam then falls on the phosphor screen, causing the appearance of a thin line indicating the electron beam's path.
it is critical for students to understand that they are not observing a beam of light passing through the slit. This should be demonstrated with a flashlight showing a beam of light is not deflected by a magnetic field prior to operation of the Crookes tube. The glow on the phosphor screen is due to electrons colliding with and exciting the phosphor. This glow lets students visualize the path of the electron beam. The key concept for students to understand is that magnetic deflection of a moving electron beam is related to the particle's charge. In the absence of a magnetic field, the electron beam experiences no force and the beam path should be a straight line. However, when a magnet is brought near the Crookes tube, students should observe that the electron beam is deflected into a curve. For best visibility of the Crookes tube screen, the disc magnet should be placed with the edge next to the side of the screen. The magnetic field will exit through the top of the magnet, then pass vertically through the Crookes tube screen, and then re-enter the bottom of the magnet. Flipping the disc magnet reverses the direction of the magnetic field and therefore the direction of the beam deflection. This is an example of the Lorenz force on a moving charge. The sign of the charge and the direction of the magnetic field determine the direction of the deflection of the electron beam. As shown in these two figures, flipping the disk magnet upside down reverses the magnetic field direction and the deflection angle of the electron beam in the Crookes tube. The Lorenz force may be demonstrated by placing a disk magnet next to the fluorescent screen. The magnetic field from the magnet deflects the electron beam passing through the slit. By flipping the magnet upside down, the deflection direction is reversed. Students should understand that it is not just the proximity of the magnet, but the direction of the magnetic field that determines the deflection direction of the electron beam. Pictures of the Crookes tube in three different scenarios are shown below. In the top and bottom image, the magnetic field is in opposing directions. In the middle image, the Crookes tube is not subjected to a magnetic field. The key concept is that the Lorenz force is a vector effect. Direction of the magnetic field determines direction of the electron beam deflection, not just proximity of the magnet. This effect may be used to determine the direction of the magnetic field passing through the Crookes tube. By use of Lorenz force equation and the right hand rule, determine the direction the magnetic field is passing through the Crookes tube in each of these scenarios. Note that the electron beam velocity is from the right to the left in these pictures. Remember that the electron charge Q is negative and therefore inverts the direction of the force. The Crookes tube experiment has demonstrated that a magnetic field can bend the path of an electron beam. A strong enough magnetic field can bend the path of a charged particle into a circular orbit. This allows electrons and ions to travel along magnetic field lines in a helical path because the magnetic field component of the Lorenz force does not act on motion parallel to the magnetic field. The radius of an electron or ion orbit in a uniform magnetic field can be calculated from the balance of the Lorenz force and the centripetal force. These effects govern how plasma moves around the Earth in space and how plasma may be guided and trapped within the magnetic field of a fusion reactor. The aurora borealis, or northern lights, is caused by plasma following the Earth's magnetic field to the north and south poles interacting with the upper atmosphere. The Earth's magnetosphere is a space surrounding Earth where plasma from the Sun interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. Plasma is blown off of the Sun and travels through space. When it gets to the Earth, a certain fraction of these particles are trapped within the magnetic field lines surrounding the planet. They follow these field lines in a helical path until they inter to intersect the Earth. This occurs at the North and South Poles where the field lines exit and enter the planet. 
The excitation of the gas in the upper atmosphere causes emission of distinct spectral lines corresponding to those gaseous elements. This becomes visible as the aurora. In 1895, Norwegian physicist Christian Birkeland created a Torella, or Little Earth, to explain why the aurora, or northern lights, occur only at the north and south poles of the Earth. Birkeland simulated the Earth's magnetosphere by placing a spherical magnet within a vacuum chamber and generating a plasma with an electrical discharge. The path the plasma follows and the interaction with the spherical magnet was analogous to the action of the Earth's magnetic field on plasma within space. Students will build a Torella to visualize the location of the aurora and Van Allen belts surrounding the Earth. In this demonstration, students should first wipe off any excess sodium hydroxide on the top nut prior to placing the spherical magnet within the vacuum chamber. The nickel-plated steel nut should be threaded onto the screw with the higher nut. The spherical dipole magnet should then be stuck to this steel nut. The plug assembly may then be reinserted into the vacuum chamber. The vacuum chamber containing the Torella should be connected to the vacuum pump by means of the vacuum hose. Students should connect the aluminum foil hat on the plasma globe to the screw connected to the spherical magnet inside the vacuum chamber by means of one of the jumper cables. Students should hold the syringe body near the vacuum line. As the vacuum chamber is pumped down, students should observe a jet forming near the pole of the magnet opposing the nut as well as a ring of plasma forming around the equator. A dark background and dark room should assist students in visualizing these effects. The vacuum chamber should be pumped down with the student holding the syringe near the vacuum connector. As the pressure decreases, a plasma will form around the magnet. This plasma will include a ring around the equator and a jet coming off of one of the poles. These are analogous to the northern lights caused by plasma hitting the atmosphere and the Van Allen belts around the equator. The plasma contacting the top magnetic pole is analogous to where plasma within the Earth's magnetic field contacts the Earth's atmosphere at the North Pole of the Earth. This excites the gas in the upper atmosphere, generating the visual aurora borealis. In this demonstration, however, the South Pole of the magnet is blocked by the nut. Students will not be able to see plasma contact in this location. During the late 1950s, the United States launched its first satellite, Explorer 1. The satellite contained a detector which showed high levels of charged particles, confirmed by later sal satellites Explorer 3 and Pioneer 3. These results led physicist James Van Allen to discover radiation belts surrounding the Earth, which are now named after him. The equatorial rings of plasma simulate where the Van Allen belts would form surrounding the Earth. The Van Allen belts contain trapped electrons and ions. The magnetic field is stronger near the poles than near the equator. This concentration of magnetic field strength pushes lower speed particles away, trapping them in a ring of space traveling around the equator of the Earth. These rings of particles form the Van Allen belts. This completes the demonstrations within the Plasma Demo Kit. For a review of plasma concepts, plasma is a state of matter that occurs in nature or is generated artificially by adding energy to matter. We can do this with an electrical discharge. An atom turns into a plasma when enough energy is added to allow the electron to escape from the nuclei. This electrical energy can be carried with wires or delivered by radio waves. With a sufficiently strong electric field, an electron colliding with a neutral atom provides enough energy to knock off additional electrons. This is a Townsend discharge. The electric field required depends on the distance between collisions. Lower pressure gas is easier to break down into a plasma. This is Passion's Law. 
Electrons recombining with nuclei generate distinct spectral lines based on the element. This may be observed with the spectroscope. Different elements will have different spectral lines. This is due to the different electron configurations. This can be used to identify an unknown element. Within a plasma, electrons and ions move freely and independently of one another. A plasma is electrically conductive and interacts with magnetic fields. A magnetic field generates a force on a charged particle moving perpendicular to the magnetic field. The direction of the force is given by the right-hand rule. This is Lorentz force law. This effect allows magnetic fields to bend an electron beam, as illustrated with a Crookes tube. With a sufficiently strong magnetic field, the Lorentz force bends an electron or ion path into a circular orbit. This allows electrons and ions to travel in a helical path along a magnetic field. Plasma from the Sun follows Earth's magnetic field lines to the North and South Poles. This causes excitation of the gases in the upper atmosphere and emission of spectral lines, causing the aurora borealis. Electrons and ions are pushed towards lower magnetic field regions. This causes plasma to be trapped around Earth's equator in the Van Allen belts.